I think MSAC's mission kind of starting out of the gate was to educate the public. And we've been trying to do that since 2001. We have run into a situation where we're teaching the same thing to the same people, and people are going, when's something going to happen? So we can, we're still educating, but we're trying to force or enable things to get moving with the plan. And that's part of what we've been working on lately. We, we put in for uh, two programs under the, sec or the Water Resources Development Act of 2016, Section 1122 and Section 1179A. And uh, the first one is to the 1122, is to try and figure out the sediment that's in the rivers, what can be done with that? Is there a use for that sediment? If you come up with a way to get the sediment out of the rivers, is there a way to have a, <laughs> a beneficial use for that? Or are we just going to have a huge pile of sand? So we've got to try and figure out some way to use use that, that sediment. Uh, go ahead. I'm going to back up just a little bit um, and tell you a little bit more about MSAC. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Been in existence since 2001, but I'm just going to back up a couple years and Mark skilled you in on some of that. Um, but our main purpose is to engage the public in pursuing ways to sustain the Missouri River reservoirs where beneficial use of the reservoirs is significantly being impacted by the accumulating sediment, which um, Tim gave us a good description of. And right now we're focusing on Lewis and Clark Lake, which is filling the fastest due to a smaller size, as Rollin said a few moments ago. Um, back two years in 2016, um, Rollin was here in Yankton and gave a great talk um, telling us uh, what's going on and uh, what could be done. We're following up. Um, as a result of that meeting, an Ohio company contacted MSAC. Um, they told us they have this technology that can help uh, with sediment. Um, and we continued those discussions for quite a long time. Uh, they made site visits out here. Um, and we know that collectors, it's not going to solve the problem. It's just, it's a way to reduce the amount of sediment coming into the Delta and the Wilson Park Lake. Um, and it would attack the Niagara River, which is the biggest contributor. Um, but like Mark was saying, um, a big part of that is what do you do with the sediment once it's taken out of the Niagara River? We need to have a use for that. Um, we're not solving all the issues by just stockpiling it. You're going to run out of land. And um, the best use of it would be, be to find a use for it. And that's what we're trying to do um, with different feasibility type projects that we applied for funding for. Um, right now, the Corps is still considering um, 94 proposals came in for Section 1122. And that's uh, about finding uh, potential uses for dredged material. And so already, we're being innovative off the bat, we're not dredging it, we're going to collect it with sediment collectors, which are supposed to be cheaper to run, um, just have a lot of benefits that we need to be looking at. Um, Ten will be selected out of those 94. I have not heard yet where that's at. Uh, there was a committee um, that submitted its recommendations um, by the end of June, um, and I have not heard what the time frame is on selection. And so now, uh, in the last couple months, we heard about Section 1179A, and these sections that we're talking about, Section 1122 and 1179A, are part of WERDA 2016, and that's the Water Resources Development Act, um, federal legislation. And 1179A, um, we brought you all here together to talk about it today, um, and just to to know more about the problem in general, because this discussion will be ongoing. Um, 1122, that's what we talked about. 
um, dollar-wise, I'll back up. Um, that project is just over $600,000, and it would be a short-term project. Um, funded 65, 35, 35 local. Um, MSAC would need to come up with about $200,000 to make that reality if it's one of the selected projects. Um, MSAC did dedicate $25,000 towards it. Um, and when you're looking at the numbers, um, ideally, I think in a best case scenario, oops, they estimate that 60% of what's coming out of the Niagara River could be collected with the sediment collectors. And that's running all year long. The feasibility study would come up with better numbers than what we have now. So in essence, you're stopping about 30% of what's coming in annually into the park. It doesn't provide sustainability, but it could take a step at reducing the annual sediment load extend the life, um, maybe make other um, ways to sustain the reservoir less expensive, or it just makes the problem smaller that you're doing. Okay, now back to 1179 A, sorry for jumping around. Um, this calls for the development and implementation of sediment management plans for reservoirs in the Missouri River watershed above Sioux City. So 1179, it would bring together what has been done so far. Uh, we know there's been mountains of research done on Lewis and Park Lake already. So let's put that together and try to carve a path forward. And why not look at what's being done in other places in the world too? Part of the process is coming up with a scope. We have been talking with Steve Kopecki, he's with the Corps in Washington, Paul Boyd in Omaha, and Brad Thompson in Omaha. And Paul and Brad could not be here today. Um, we planned this meeting. Um, an opportunity arose that Rollin was in the area, so that's why we picked today. The Corps, Gary is here from the Corps, so it's not like they're not here. But I just want to make that clear, we're already talking about a follow-up meeting where Brad and Paul would be there. There would be more information about how Section 1179A would work with a cost-share arrangement and what we can, where's the flushing studies at, just where are we at. And that should happen within the next month on the tree. We did submit a plan, or a letter to the court requesting this plan. The Corps responded back that we need support of a local unit of government um, either as a sponsor or supporting us in doing this. And it is a 50-50 cost share. And throughout today I think people will allude to that this isn't just another study. Um, this plan would be to formulate a plan to come up with what we're going to do as an action. And so, um, we really do appreciate all of you being here today, and um, we're going to hear from stakeholders and see what everyone's issues are and how the scope of 1179A can best find the solutions to sustaining those one, one thing that's important with all this is Highway 12 by Niagara is one of the most surveyed pieces of land on this world. I don't know what happens, but every month or two, there's some a survey team out there. And that's part of what we're doing here. We've had study after study. There's been proposals. We've had partial sediment plans going on. But they've all just stalled, and it's because we haven't had the input of people like you. So that's why we appreciate you being here, and together we can proceed with getting something done. Tim, he was on a conference call yesterday. I don't know if you have anything to add. No, right here. Oh. With the um, conference call with Brad? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the. It was encouraging to talk to Brad, and, and the 1179 process uh, 
certainly has potential, I think, for the uh, MSAC, for MSAC and the whole sedimentation issue out there. I think, uh, you know, the one thing that uh, we've kind of been talking about is that we've, we've been talking for a long, long time, and, and there's been a lot of studies done, there's been a lot of uh, proposals put out there of potential solutions to this sediment problem. You know, first we had to really understand it, what it was, where it was coming from, and then people started coming up with potential solutions to it. Uh, but we're at the point now where, you know, the, enough of that. Now we need to, to figure out what, it, what is it that we're going to do and figure out a way to fund it and implement it. But before we can really grasp that and say this is what we want to fund and implement, we have to have really have to have somebody take a look at what were all those potential solutions and what is the best method you should use or the best combination of methods. And in talking to Brad, what kind of became apparent was that this is potentially where the Corps of Engineers and the 1179A uh, process can help us, that they could actually you know, have their engineering staff take a look at all those proposed solutions out there and basically come out with a recommendation of what, what should MSAC and all the stakeholders in this room pursue going forward to get funded and implemented. Unless you have any questions about what we've been doing, we can move on in the agenda to stakeholders. Sounds good. So my name is Neil Wagner. I'm an industry outreach and development rep with the South Florida Department of Tourism. I'm just here today to talk about the importance of the Missouri River and Lewis and Clark Lake to South Florida's tourism industry. First, a quick little recap about tourism. After agriculture, it is our state's second biggest industry. We bring about 14 million visitors to South Dakota every year, and those visitors spend about $4 billion here in our state. The Missouri River serves as a historical and cultural centerpiece of the region, as well as an outdoor recreation mecca. Along with places like Mount Rushmore and the Badlands, the Missouri River is one of the Department of Tourism's great eight, which are places that put South Dakota on the map, and they're important uh, focal parts of our marketing efforts. Lewis and Clark Lake is one of South Dakota's top attractions, complete with campgrounds, hiking, biking and horse trails, swimming beaches, a marina, a resort, and so much more. It's one of the gems in the Southeast tourism region, a haven for fishermen, and as a Yankton native, it's a place that's dear to my heart. With over 720,000 visitors last year, Lewis and Clark Lake is our state's second most visited state park. This park district is also a major economic driver for South Dakota as it brought in $14.7 million in value-added state GDP and over $1.4 million in state and local taxes in 2015. Lewis and Clark Lake is vital to tourism here in this region and for our state. The South Dakota Department of Tourism looks forward to promoting the lake, this region, and the state for years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, the Spencer Dam update with Terry Julesgard. For those of you that uh, don't know what NRDs do, well, there will be a back sheet in the back there for you to pick up and, and see what the Lower Niagara NRD has been working on the last year or so. But first off, I'm going to back up to this whole Spencer Dam project of ours started back in actually 2009 when the uh, Nebraska Department of Natural Resources, in their infinite wisdom, decided to declare our uh, basin as fully appropriated, which said that we do not have enough water uh, to allow any more uh, surface water or groundwater development. Uh, so with that determination, uh, the three of the districts there went together. We filed a suit against the Department of Natural Resources, and in 2011, we actually won, and that decision was re reversed. Well, that following year, in 2012, we were setting down Lincoln. The four NRDs, or three NRDs, are on the Niobrara, and a couple of those that they consider hydrologically connected, saying, what are we going to do to keep this designation from happening again? And we come up with this crazy idea that, uh, why don't we purchase the surface water appropriations that are held by NPPD from, from them, and then that gives us water that we can use for 
managing the river and uh, still allowing some development, but yet making sure we maintain water in the river. With that conversation, we decided to, hey, not a bad idea. So we went to uh, MPPD and says, hey, are you interested in selling your uh, water appropriation? And uh, they says, yeah, we can work something out. So the discussion started in uh, 2012. Uh, we uh, spent about uh, two and a half years in discussion. And finally, in uh, September of 2015, we had our uh, memorandum of understanding of uh, what we were going to do to purchase the Spencer Hydro facility. Uh, they decided that they couldn't sell just their water. They wanted to sell the whole thing. So they says, yep, $12 million, it's all yours. Well, with that, uh, since uh, 2015, we've been working on a purchase agreement. Uh, we had uh, one of the MPPD people that was kind of in charge or supposed to be the, the front man for, for MPPD. He got stuck between the lawyers and so we were getting nowhere with the, the process of the purchase agreement. Finally, the, the, our legal counsel says, hey, we got to get this middleman out of here in about two months. And we had a purchase agreement, which come out uh, uh, right at the first of, uh, of uh, the year. Since then, uh, our district has uh, uh, approved the purchase agreement. The two, one of the other districts has uh, said that they're not sure they want to go along with that, so we might be down to four districts in this. Uh, two of them had a couple of provisions that they wanted to do before, so right now we have the signature date of the purchase agreement set for uh, September 7th of, of coming up here. So hopefully we'll have that, uh, that done. Uh, we're working on uh, funding now, trying to figure out where we're going to come up with the uh, with the money, so that's that's where that part of it is. As far as what's going to happen with Spencer, um, once we take ownership of it, uh, the the electric generation will stop. Uh, then we'll have to figure out at that point uh, how we're going to manage the dam itself. Uh, I think we're looking at trying to be at getting. We want to get down to the least amount of maintenance as possible or management, uh, so that's going to be probably getting it so the gates are open all the time. It won't be a, we'll just open them up and let it run, and I'm sure there'll be a, a, a process that we'll end up using to try to get that done. But our ultimate goal is to get it back to basically free-flowing through there. Uh, the Game of Parks, which we're working with on this, Nebraska Game of Parks, they want to leave the structure in place as a basically a, a block for potential endangered or invasive species moving up the river. Uh, so that's that's pretty much kind of where we're at on the on on the Spencer Dam. So any questions? Um, I guess maybe I missed it. Uh, do, will there be another year of flushes, or where are we at? Um, yeah, right now, as long as it's uh, in operation the way it is, they're, they're, they're still in their uh, their sluicing process that they are right now until until we take ownership. And like I said, then that'll probably change a little. We'll probably, there'll be more for a longer period of time until we get it down to the point where we got, uh, we can leave the gates open. So. Because it's not a flood control structure, so if uh, if they get a big rain upstream, the gates go open. So, uh, yeah. When was that dam constructed? Uh, it was constructed in the late twenties, and I think it took about what four or five years to fill up. Has there been any discussion about the rate that we could expect the sediment to come through? Or is that something that forces We haven't had anything on that. I, I've had a little bit of discussion with uh, uh, with Paul Boyd, and because they're the ones that kind of they have a you know a, a permit with with MPPD, 
because that was one of the things we were concerned, how is this going to affect that? And I says, once once we get it to the point, it's going to be a, uh, it'll get to the point where it's just a step. We're near not going to have those big slugs of sand coming. It'll allow it to build some bigger deltas there below the dam, and they'll stay there. I mean, so, uh, and all the sand that's in, in the dam other than what'll once the channel is created there all that sand is going to stay there too so sandy one day uh, many years ago i measured how much sand was moving down the niobrera and it came out to be 2,000 tons a day so if that's representative that's what would be passing the dam mm -hmm. okay. anything else it sounds like there just might be varying opinions about how much sediment will come out of the reservoir once the gates are open. Right. Yeah. And it, I don't know that we can. We'll have a hard fast number that we'll be able to come up with. Mm -hmm. I said well, until it gets down to just that channel. You know. I mean, there's a lot of that that's already vegetating up. You know, above the dam. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Because it's, I mean, it's still filling there too. So I mean, it's, uh, it's getting uh, more and more vegetation growing within the lake itself. So the more of that vegetation grows, the more of that sand that's going to stay there. So thank you. Okay, the Cedar Knox Rural Water Project. Uh, good morning. I'm Annette Sedbeck, uh, general manager of the Lewis and Clark NRD, and this is it's Terry Johnson. I'm manager of the Cedar Notch uh, Rural Water Project. And for those of you who are familiar with NRDs um, and wonder why an NRD is involved with the Rural Water Project, uh, the reason for that is uh, the state mandated that any time that there are rural customers being served by a water project that the NRD um, is there to represent the rural interests. And so that's why the NRD is involved. If we were dealing with a project that was just serving um, maybe the community of Crofton or something like that, or serving Crofton and St. Helena as we did when we first started and there were no rural customers, then they could work that between just the project itself and not have to have the NRD involved. But we represent the rural, um, rural needs. Um, so therefore, with the, there's an advisory committee on the Rural Water Board that makes all the recommendations to the locally elected NRD board that then ratifies those decisions and moves forward with the recommendations that were made. Um, so the reason we're here today is to talk to you a little bit about our concerns with sediment and where we're headed with our Rural Water Project right now. So I'm going to back up and give you a little bit of history on the project. In the mid-1970s, there were several rural residents around St. Helena and Crofton and Fordyce that had issues finding a quality groundwater source for drinking. Those groups got together, formed a community coalition, came to the NRD and asked for assistance in finding a source of water to serve multiple people um, and some communities they were hoping would come along on that journey. So it took several years they investigated groundwater to some degree, um, but they really didn't have to do much searching on groundwater because when they looked to the Devil's Nest region, um, there was a water plant, water treatment plant for drinking water sitting there. And it had only been used, I think for producing snow at that time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for the, the ski resort that they had built in the Devil's Nest region. And it was sitting there, already had the intake in the lake, ready to use, it had to have modifications made, but it was for sale because the development had gone to bump. And so they purchased that, they ran some piping and started serving water to 280 rural hookups and the communities of Crofton and St. Helena in 1981. So today we're at the point where we're serving 900, um, almost 900 rural hookups, four communities, um, several SIDs along the lake. Uh, we serve um, hookup for the core. We serve some for Nebraska Game and Parks recreation areas. 
and we continue to grow every year. So, you know, going from 282 communities to nine, nearly 904 communities has put a lot of pressure on the system. We've needed to consider expansion. So a few years ago, we started looking at what that would take to increase the capacity at the plant. And as we looked at the plant, we needed to look at our intake and uh, what longevity we would have with that intake for paying for plants, the plant improvements, which would take 40 years for us to pay. But when you look at the map provided by MSAC and where our intake is, and what the long term, by the time we would get our plant paid off, we would have been under the sediment for several years, probably 10 to 15 years when you consider that encroaching leading edge there. So Terry's here to talk to you a little bit more about the options we're pursuing to uh, continue water service to those customers. Okay, yeah, so as uh, Annette said, our, our water treatment plant's up in the Devil's Nest. If you don't know where our intake is, it's almost directly across from the colony on the, on the South Dakota side. Um, Presently, our biggest issue, of course, is sedimentation around the intake. Um, we just had divers in the area on the project uh, just the last couple days, and it is indeed um, impacting our, our uh, intake. And we have really nowhere to go with it, upstream, downstream, even further out. It's, uh, so we're in the process right now of, of looking for potential new sources of, of water in the Long term, it's probably going to, uh, you know, it's going to be much more difficult to continue to maintain um, serving our customers plus growth. And right now, we produce about uh, a million gallons. We have the capacity to produce about a million gallons a day, and we're going to increase that to maybe about 1.2 million. We're not there yet. We, in our highest uh, uh, production, is maybe 850, 860 um, thousand, but. We're reaching that point. And another, besides the sedimentation is our biggest problem, we also are under administrative order for total trihalomethanes, which is a byproduct of the organic material, which as sedimentation comes in, increases that in chlorination. So we're, we have that as well to look at. So we are looking at potential new sources <coughs> for the groundwater, and we are doing uh, aeroelectronic electromagnetic flights this, uh, this summer, beginning right now, today, to look at uh, the, the uh, sedimentation, get a view down to see where we might have potential sources of uh, groundwater. We don't, we don't know until we get that data back of uh, what we're going to be seeing, and, and also the quality of that. It's, that's always been an issue. Uh, hardness uh, potential for nitrates, um, but until we have a good look and see where we can uh, do some more test drill, test holes, and see what kind of water we're dealing with, we have to at least look at that and try to either find out if that's a good source or rule it out. Another source uh, for us would be to purchase from Yankton um, and uh, use their water um, and distribute it to our customers. So. That's kind of where we, we sit at the moment is um, for the long term, it doesn't look like our intake you know, is going to be sustainable and we're going to have to find um, another, another source. So, yes? How long do you suspect you have before we have to oh, we're, we're looking at maybe 15 to 25 years uh, max probably before something you know, we're really impacted. But it is indeed uh, just our recent, you know, divers said that uh, the intake is gradually being covered. It's a two-sided problem as well because the sediment may be out 25 years, um, maybe even a little longer. I mean, we're being conservative there. So the sediment is one side of things, but we have to address our production capacity. and. If we can't ensure that we're going to be producing out of that plant 40 years, we need to make sure that we're putting our funds and best representing our customers um, and, and being able to provide them water for the long term. So it would be nice if it was just the sediment that was the issue and we could stay there longer, but we, I, it just doesn't look feasible. So, but from a, a sediment standpoint, your case is an interesting example because we often talk about the town of Niagara 
was probably been the canary in the coal mine. They, they saw the, the impact of this very early on and sort of should have alerted everybody that, hey, there's a problem coming. Your problem is sort of on the other end of the spectrum where we're watching this delta front progress. And it's, it's several decades before it would actually get to your intakes. But it's what's happening underneath the water well ahead of that visual delta front that's already impacting your system. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it's not visual. You know, can't see it, but it's, it's there. And it impacts our ch the chemistry of our water as well. Yes. I, just this is kind of a goofy idea, but like, like you ever, could, you, could you take like an offshore oil platform type concept and put some big wells out there in the lake? I know that we all, but and just drill out of there. I mean, we've talked about that option, but our. Where our intake is located is on bedrock. So there's nothing to drill down into. And for us to uh, move the intake further downstream in the lake to where there is that option for sediment, um, the cost is just astronomical to do that. Um, we also looked about going across the river to the east and it's this, or to the north. It's the same thing. Same thing. It's just not a feasible cost-effective mechanism. Mm -hmm. And there's no guarantee that they, if we're in the lake, that they won't have problems with sedimentation as well, that we would be able to maintain service. So, um, I do have a couple handouts that I'll put in the back. Um, we've gone, we've talked to our congressmen and senators about this issue, um, because any anything that we do to resolve this issue is going to be incredibly expensive. So we want to make sure that we do the best we can for our, our residents and customers to get that cost down on whatever project we would go ahead with. So I brought a handout that I provided to them back in March. Just gives a little history. I even have an MSAC map on the back of the progression of the sediment, um, if you're interested. And then the other thing is, um, Terry mentioned that we're doing aeroelectromagnetic surveys right now. And what those surveys do is they look at resistivity in the subsurface geology so that we can identify areas where there may be coarser sands and gravels and we can identify the extent of those sands and gravels. Um, and we can also look at the sediment composition that's above those. There, we have information based on test holes from CSD over the years, but this gives us huge areas where we can actually, in some instances when the lines are really closely flown, we can even estimate the amount of water in uh, storage in these uh, potential aquifer systems. These surveys don't see the water table. So the water table, we're dependent on data from the 1990s, but it gives us a good idea, a good starting point. So what we're looking for is areas where we have coarse sand and gravel, and we could have large aerial, aerial extent where we, we have the sustainability of those sources for the long term. Concerns are hardness and nitrates. So we have a lot of limitations if we find water in one place there's limitations on getting it to the systems. If we find it somewhere else, there's different, there's just a whole myriad of issues that go along with groundwater for us. So we're starting to put together a really complicated puzzle. We're looking forward to seeing how that comes out. So there's a handout on that AEM survey and a website where you can see the information if you're interested in past reports. So, Terry, did you have anything else? I just got the, the BY is right across the river. Are you guys having the same issues? Potentially? Not, not at this point in not time. Um, we have our intakes dove twice a year, every year. And I guess in the, in the planning when it was put there, they appropriated the lot, right placement because it sits right on the edge of the old river channel. There are times where we see sediment increase, but typically by the next six month dive later on, it's washed downstream. So, yeah, channels on the other side, on your side of the river. Yeah. We're, we're under 22 foot of water before you get to our intake structure, so they're, they're fairly And if you can stand on the top of our intake and just right. and normally you're just be at about chest level with the water in the lake. So completely different yeah. scenario. And you guys are in, in the channel with sediment and we right, are... Right on the edge of the old river, river channel. Yeah. Yeah. And we are on bedrock. At the yeah, right. it's like 400 foot out from the shore. 400 foot out from the shore. Any other questions? Maybe Springfield, is that kind of the same situation you're in the channel? Is that yeah. Because we be our intake probably if you stood on it, you're not gonna be underwater either. Because probably the area where our intake is, the rivers may be ten, twelve foot deep on it. Yeah. Right there. Similar. Similar. 
Have you had to move your intake? Not, not since I've been there. And is it just a strain in the gravity flow? Is that what you have? No, we uh, pumps. That pump it. You have to pump it. Okay. Yeah. And we have the problems too with all the vegetation, you know, and everything else in the water, which we have to change. We have, we're, we're looking into a whole new water plant now because we have to start treating it differently now. Do you have to remove sediment too? <coughs> yeah, somewhat, but not a whole lot. No. I just want to ask one question, kind of a big picture question to Rollin and maybe Tim. Um, one of the things why we have reservoirs, I guess, would you say that for drinking water supplies, is it more desirable to use river or reservoir water as opposed to groundwater? It's much more sustainable to use river water as river water recharges within a few months, <clears throat> whereas groundwater um, in most parts of the world takes much, much longer. Now here in this region, groundwater is very special. And uh, there may be opportunities to sink wells into the sediment within the reservoir and with screens pump right out. It's as if you're pumping groundwater, but you're pumping surface water that's drawn down. So here in this area, uh, you're very fortunate to have the groundwater you do. But in general, much better to use surface water for water supply than groundwater. Groundwater is not sustainable in most parts of the world. We've been lucky here that ground, our groundwater is recharged by precipitation and we've had some pretty good rain events, but any groundwater system where precipitation is the, the primary recharge, you're going to have potential issues at some point or another. I, know, I understand the position you're in. I, I'm just trying to make our position too for why we mm -hmm. sustain it. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if we could ensure that the <laughs> intake would be viable, we wouldn't be looking towards groundwater. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your, your time. Thank you. Dan Amsek, Larry. Mm -hmm. Good morning. I'm Larry Weiss. Uh, I'm an MSAC board member. My wife Colleen and I live in Pierre, and uh, we've uh, had some experiences with groundwater just discussed in the Missouri River. Uh, I got on the MSAC board, and Howard, you could probably correct me with dates because my memory is not as good as I'd like. But uh, shortly after 2001, when, uh, when MSAC started, uh, Gary Drews, the mayor up here at that time, uh, was the president, as I recall. And uh, then, of course, uh, elected officials changed positions, so uh, he left uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, and. Uh, I became a commissioner in Pierre in 1997 and uh, left the commission in 2012. My thought process is elected officials ought to be in their position for a specific period of time to accomplish what's needed to be accomplished and then leave so someone else can assume that responsibility. Uh, which is what I did. We lived in Southeast Pier. Some of you that may have some familiarity with Pier knows that that's on the east edge of Pier, adjacent to the river. Uh, houses were built there in the 70s and 80s, and uh, there was great concern about building houses there because of groundwater problems uh, that were visible at the time they started building houses there. When uh, they dug a trench to pour footings for a house, and overnight the trench was full of water, 
where did it come from? It didn't rain overnight. Groundwater came up. Should never have built houses below ground level in that area to start with. But unfortunately, politics enters the picture. So you city folks, elected officials, that have responsibility for planning and zoning and people building and select locations, think about this issue. What is going to be the issue in the future, if any? That needs to be part of the process. Uh, the mayor at that time, uh, some of the commissioners, uh, were familiar with the property owner there, and uh, sometimes folks are afraid they might hurt somebody's feelings. That's not what we're elected for. We're elected to do the right thing for all of the citizens at some reasonable expense. So, uh, houses were built, a few of them full depth basements, eight foot below ground level, and the groundwater was up here at uh, maybe five feet below ground level. So, uh, start having problems with groundwater. We formed a uh, group in Southeast Pier called Southeast Pier Property Owners Association and uh, it was led by an individual that had a full depth basement that lived along with his wife in that house for four years with water in the basement. Certainly an unhealthy situation. So we formed this group, started working with congressional delegation, and uh, at one point in time, the civilian head of the Corps of Engineers uh, came to Pierre to look at this situation. Uh, we uh, uh, figured out a small period of time when he could come to Southeast Pier and look at at least one house that was impacted. So he looked at George Van Dell's house, was old depth basement. He was the president of the Property Owners Association. Didn't have anything in the basement except some decoys in one corner of one room. So we went downstairs and there's puddles of water all over the basement floor, every room. And uh, the head of the core says to George, well, doesn't this water sitting here have an impact? And he said, no, oh, the decoys really, they really don't mind <laughs> we got water in the floor. But that was the start of the Southeast Pier buyout. Town of Niobrara was moved because increasing water levels as a result of increased sediment, groundwater increases uh, for a certain water level in the reservoir. Uh, groundwater keeps coming up. Her sediment keeps coming up, groundwater keeps coming up. So, uh, we uh, did get a $35 million allocation. That's what we in Southeast Pier asked for. The Corps decided we needed to get the elevation of every house the lowest inhabitable floor. And that was done uh, through survey. And during this time period, the uh, thought process was, well, if we're going to do this in Pier, the Corps said, we then have to do the same thing at Fort Pier. We in Pier had asked the Fort Pier folks to join with us in this effort to uh, try to get something accomplished. No, 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 we want nothing to do with that. Well, 
Unfortunately, in Pierre we had $100,000 houses. In Fort Pierre we had $350,000 and $400,000 houses along the river. So when we started spreading the money, uh, three houses uh, in Pierre would equal one in Fort Pierre. One long money was gone, and we've only uh, gotten uh, a portion of the houses moved from that area. Yesterday, I looked in the Capitol Journal, and the Wahi Dam elevation was 1616.25. The top of the emergency spillway is 1620. So that's three and three quarter feet from the top of the emergency spillway. Discharge was 46,100. Some of you on <coughs> iPhones are whizzes at checking websites. Check Oahe Dam and see what the discharge is today and what the elevation is. Uh, so, in 1996 and 7, we had uh, about 50 to 60,000 CFS uh, going past Pier Ottawahi Dam daily from spring until near December. During that time period, uh, most people were putting sump pumps in, as we did. We put two sump pumps in and uh, we still had water because groundwater just kept coming up. So we uh, finally had to uh, just abandon the fact that we were going to be able to uh, keep our house in a livable condition. And uh, we were in the buyout process along with others in that area. In March of 2021, uh, the uh, Corps bought us out, and uh, in September of 2001, we moved to another location up here. Where we were living, we could look under the railroad bridge. Where we are now, we look over the railroad bridge. So, uh, <laughs> changed our elevation significantly. But the city of Pier, uh, many folks there uh, said, oh, settlement's not a problem, until they hit a sandbar with their $80,000 fishing boat, or until they got water in the basement. Then they were interested, well, maybe we got to do something. So, a number of houses been moved, I don't know, maybe 60, 50 to 60 in that area. There's probably 30, 40 more that ultimately should be moved. And some of those 30 to 40 are going to have groundwater in the basement this year. Because the reservoirs are full and they've got to be discharged. So, we got 50 to 60,000 CFS going out of Hawaii Dam past Pier. There's going to be groundwater in basements, just like Mary has not groundwater but actual water on her fields. So uh, that's the situation. Uh, we will continue to work on this issue. Very frankly, that's one of the reasons why I continue to stay on this board, because we have to do something about this issue, because it's a economic issue as well as a lot of others. I had a realtor tell me when we were going through this uh, buyout and potential sale of houses, you guys shouldn't be talking about this. That's going to have a negative impact on your house values. And I said, what in the hell do you want me to do? Stick my head in the sand and drown? I was ticked, I tell you, because that in fact is what would happen. The groundwater was 
within feet of the top of the ground. Questions, comments? Howard, did I say anything erroneous? No, you're pretty well hit it. Okay, because Howard was there all during that time. So anyway, uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it, I guess, uh, like the saying goes. But, uh, we really do need to continue this effort. And uh, please, elected folks, don't let people build on floodplains when the groundwater is only a few feet below the surface. What was the result? $35 million in this case. Taxpayer money allocated for this purpose. Did it do any good? <clears throat> it moved us out of that area. But as far as impacting groundwater level or sediment level, it didn't do a ounce of good. Questions? Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Okay, from the town of Niobrara, Jody Stark, chairman of the Niobrara Town Board. Then I'm going to sneak Megan Hannafelt from with uh, Knox County in right after that. Okay, thanks, Mark. I guess uh, as a representative, Jody Stark, uh, Town Board, the Village of Niobrara. I probably just have three topics that come to mind. As I look at the city of Niobrara, it's very dependent on tourism, recreation, the economy is really driven by that. And uh, I don't know if I know of any business that probably isn't impacted or relies on uh, our tourism and recreation in the whole area. So. That is a very, very big thing, very uh, concern for us uh, in Niobrara, just uh, the dollars that come into the community. Uh, the other thing I look at is river access. We need river access, and right now with the high level of water and sedimentation, uh, we do have a boat dock there. It's really, we don't even have access today as we speak. Um, that's, a, that's a big thing for us because uh, you can go down on any given weekend and there's probably 60 boats there. Most people are all coming to enjoy the river where it's fishing or boating or you know we got a lot of the duck hunters in the fall as well so uh, that's the other thing another thing that comes to mind that uh, I think that uh, probably affects the village and is the, the infrastructure long term we still have a well down in the old town or lagoon system um, some people mentioned the roads and bridges and things like that so long term I think that's going to affect us as well so that's probably the three topics that come to my mind that as I as I look at for the concerns of the area of Niobrara. Thank you, Jody. Yeah. And Megan, if you would. Yeah. yeah. Um, I work on economic development for Knox County, and I guess from a countywide perspective, um, tourism is a huge industry in our county, um, and specifically the north half of our county is the Missouri River. Um, and so we have the two communities of Niagara and Crofton that I serve um, directly impacted by what happens along the river, of course. And so, I, you know, with that, we just want to throw our support for what the, what MSAC is doing. Um, I guess annually we do see over about half a million visitors is what we've been reported on from our two state parks, which would be the Niagara State Park and Wygon. And so with that many visitors, it obviously leads to business opportunities and happenings that, that do go on in our county. And so from the economic development standpoint, we do look at how our businesses are impacted, not only um, like within Crofton and Niobrara, but even the rest of our county sees the impact of the folks heading up to the river and that type of thing. So uh, just here to throw this, all of our support for this back and know that we, we are here to support your efforts and um, really, care about what is going on with our rivers, both the Niagara and the Missouri, and lots of the creeks too. That I'll throw in one, one other bit about uh, the uh, riverfront properties. Uh, Knox County is a big agricultural county, uh, but 5% of the total evaluated property is along that river. So that little 1% piece of land is worth a lot of money and if those houses are no longer usable if we can't get our boats in the water uh, which is what's happening right now with the flooding at Niobrara it, it really impacts 
not only the town but the county's infrastructure. So that's something more. Let's go with Carmen from Yankton. I'm Carmen Schramm with the Yankton Area Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to thank Sandy for allowing me to come in and talk just briefly about the economic impact of what uh, the river does for our particular community. As far as the Chamber of Commerce, we represent the Yankton area. And so we represent businesses in Yankton, but also our neighbors to the south in Nebraska. Uh, we go to the west as well and to the east. And so we, we do represent a lot of different industries, agencies, businesses that rely very much on the quality of life and the recreational aspects of this particular river. And so in order for us to tell you a little bit more about our involvement with this, we advocate. And so when it came to our going to D.C. like we go to annually, Charlie sits on my governmental affairs committee. Uh, we were having various conversations and we reached out to Sandy to say, hey, what can we do? Because we have tried to get in front of the Corps of Engineers for years. My predecessor before me was doing a lot of advocacy as far as the river. And I can honestly say that this year it was inspiring for us to go to D.C. because it was a good conversation. And so when we came back and we were hearing about 1179, we were like, we need to do something with this. And we were helping to facilitate 1122 for Sandy when we were in D.C. Yankton is fortunate because we have four very diverse industries. You know, agriculture is our number one, manufacturing is two, healthcare is three, and tourism is number four. So when we have a down year in one of those four industries, there's three others that are usually propping us up, and we know a lot of other communities do not have that same diverse uh, climate. But tourism has been a strong factor for us. Quality of life in Yankton is what helps us attract businesses, families to our area, and the river is probably our number one quality of life issue that we can constantly rely on. So for us, it is incredibly important that we protect this natural resource, that we do something to help with the sustainability of it. I wanted to add just a few more things to uh, what Neil had said as far as the numbers and the impact numbers, because in addition to what he said with Lewis and Clark's numbers, the river attracts closer to 1.9 million visitors if you take into account all the Nebraska parks and highway acres and Santee and the Corps of Engineers. So we just want to make sure that you understand there's a lot more visitors that are coming to this particular area on both sides of this river. And out of the $4.8 million in state and local tax revenue that's collected in Yankton County, roughly $3.4 million of that is collected from out-of-state visitors. We have a lot of in-state, but the, you know those visitors that come to this area are highly influential as far as our revenue. 4.88% of Southeast region's visitor spending took place in Yankton County. So for us, that is absolutely an economic necessity. Yankton County's visitors spent, um, they exceeded 71 million in 2017. 30% of that came from food and beverages. And Yankton County's visitor spending increased over a million dollars from 2016 to 2017. Imagine what would happen to our area if this, and Springfield can speak to it because you know they, they've seen the impact of it. We are no different than Niagara as far as the importance of, of tourism and, and what comes to our industry. So, you know, we just want to state that we know a lot of the smaller areas around us as well in Nebraska that we're working with, some of our, our members in this room. Um, we all feel the need that we are here to support this. We need to make something happen. When I moved to Yankton 35 some years ago, uh, this conversation was taking place. And so we totally agree and put our support behind it that something needs to happen. So thank you very much. Hey, anybody else have comments that they'd like to throw in? Go ahead. I'll have to make my comments from here because getting out might trip me up. Uh, I'm Howard Paul, I'm the technical coordinator for MSAC, and I was the original executive director. A little bit of history. In March, or in uh, 99 or 2000, at Springfield, in a room full of people, the Corps of Engineers, Assistant District Engineer from Omaha, made the statement that the Corps did not consider sediment a problem. They considered it a situation that they had predicted in the construction of the dams, and it was right on schedule. Larry and I heard the same thing at Brookings at a speech 
given by a Corps of Engineers representative a year later, 2001. Right, Larry? Yep. We kept the pressure on. In March of 2002, Colonel Ubalodi, the district engineer at Omaha, made the statement, Mary was there, that yes, sediment is a problem in the reservoirs and we would like to work with MSAC to solve it. Since then, we've had cooperation from the Corps. A little bit of background. I was a consulting engineer. I was a city engineer here in South Dakota for years. We took our water out of the James River. Thank goodness we had the best water treatment plant man in the state. Uh, it, the joke used to be that when you drank a glass of water at, at Heron, you got your fish, you got your beef, you got your vegetables all in one shot. And if we were, the river was low and we needed water, we'd call Aberdeen and ask them to flush all their toilets. <laughs> it was that bad. But my point is that we have to take care of our water. Water is the one really essential thing of our lives. We have to take care of it. We were, I operated as a consulting engineer in Mitchell for years. Lake Mitchell was our water supply. Guess what, folks? Now it's recommended no immersion sports, no swimming, don't fall off your water skis, and don't eat the fish a good share of the year. We have to take care of our water. It's a limited resource. <coughs> now, I was also the first engineer in the Menu was shown a real water project. It serves three Indian reservations and about three counties that are non-Indian. It took us years. I became the first engineer on that project in 1965. I was still working on it in 2000 when I retired. And they finally finished up somewhere, I believe around 2016, the last pipe went in the ground. It takes years. And don't blame the Corps of Engineers, folks. The Corps of Engineers can only do what Congress tells them to do and what they give them the money to do. You have to be, to rural water projects, we made numerous trips on the Minnewashone into Washington. That's where the money is. That's where the power is. If we want the Corps to do something with this, we have to put the pressure on in Washington. Now, the alternative to that is to stick our heads in the sand and let things happen without our involvement. And if we want to stick our head in the sand, there's a hell of a lot of sand out in Lewis and Clark Reservoir to do it with. Thank you.